for our final talk, we have, as you all know, His Eminence Cardinal Luis Antonio Tagli. He needs no introduction. Uh, everybody knows who the great Cardinal Tagli is. And just in case you don't, he is the prefect of the Congregation for the Evangelization of Peoples. He earned, which I think is very important, a doctoral degree at the Catholic University of America in my hometown of Washington, D.C. Wow. <laughs> and has been appointed as a member of the International Theological Commission. In the Philippines, he worked in various parishes as rector of the diocesan seminary and for many years as a professor of theology in four different seminaries. Pope John Paul II in 2001 appointed him Bishop of Imus, a diocese of 2.6 million Catholics. In 2011, he was appointed Archbishop of Manila and he was appointed Cardinal in 2012 at the ripe old age of 55. He participated in almost every synod, at least that I remember. Every week, he has his own television program, The Word Exposed. Cardinal Tagli comments on the readings of the Mass for the following Sunday. He is the president of the Catholic Biblical Federation and is president of Caritas Internationalis. And I present to you now Cardinal Tagli. Thank you. Thank you, Your Eminence. Hello. Good, good afternoon. Buenas tardes. Uh, buon pomeriggio. Bonsoir. Oh, is it already bonsoir or not yet? <laughs> As we come to the conclusion of this symposium, we renew our thanks and congratulations to the organizers, especially His Eminence, Cardinal Mark Ouellet, whose initiative and perseverance have inspired us all. Thank you very much, Your Eminence. And you, dear participants, have been gifted with much uh, teaching and wisdom from the Holy Father himself and our speakers these past days. Most of you probably desire to go now, at this moment, to a quiet place, to internalize and pray over what you have heard. Am I right? Yes. Uh, yes. So I have decided to offer a light and hopefully brief reflection on the topic, the joy of mission. And tante grazie Chiara, no? for you ended your, your sharing with la gioia, la gioia. We did not talk about this. Huh? So it must have been uh, God's uh, hand at work the joy of mission. Let me start by sharing two experiences. During the Synod of Bishops on the Youth, the bishops in our English-speaking language group asked some of the youth representatives about their friends' or peers' impression of the church. What do the young people think of the church? And one of them said, and I quote, the experience of my friends of their parish is that of priests who are angry, impatient, negative, and unapproachable. They criticize persons during homilies and talk always about rules. So after the Mass, 
my friends go to the Bible services of other Christian groups to encounter Jesus. I was shocked and saddened to hear this, but at the same time, I was glad to have been challenged by the youth. The other experience happened during the celebration of Catechetical Month in a diocese, attended by children, their parents, and the catechists. Instead of giving a conference, I interviewed some children about what they have learned in catechism classes. Many of them gave wonderful answers that must have affirmed the catechists. But one girl raised her hand. I asked her what her significant experience of her catechist was, to which she answered, quiet, quiet, quiet. Then the girl sat down. That was her experience of catechism. <laughs> the, the, why are you laughing? <laughs> These experiences prompted me to reflect on joy in the lives of the baptized and lay and ordained ministers. Even in ordinary life, there are many reasons why we feel tired, empty, and joyless. But I ask myself, is it possible that one reason for the loss of joy in a baptized person or a minister of the church is the lack or weakening of the sense of mission? Without a commitment to mission, the priesthood of the baptized or consecrated life and the ministerial priesthood are deprived of joy. Why? Because the priesthood of Christ is intrinsically linked to his mission. Yeah. End of introduction. I now go to three simple points. I hope they will sound simple. The first point, the priesthood of Christ according to the letter to the Hebrews. Where according to the author of the letter, Jesus' unique priesthood which surpasses and fulfills all other forms of priesthood is a priesthood of a holy life. A life that is sacrifice. Now, the word sacrifice does not mean suffering. Sacrifice, satcher, or set apart. Fatcher, to make, to make holy. That's sacrifice. And therefore, a life made holy is pleasing to God. It is the sacrifice acceptable to God. There are two main components to Jesus' priesthood and sacrifice of a holy life. The first is his total obedience to the Father who sent him. Hebrew says, and I quote, On coming into the world, Jesus said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. Holocausts and sin offerings you took no delight in. Then I said, as is written of me in the book, I have come to do your will, O God. Hebrews 10, 5-7. The holiness of someone who in his body will do the will of God. The second element of holiness 
is Jesus' communion with and compassion, mercy towards sinners. This is holiness. The letter to the Hebrew says, and I quote, Jesus was made for a little while lower than the angels, that through God's gracious will, he might taste death for the sake of all men and women. Indeed, it was fitting that when bringing many children to glory, God should make their leader in the work of salvation perfect through suffering. He who consecrates and those who are consecrated have one and the same Father. Therefore, he is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. Hebrews 2, 9 to 11. Calling the sinners, the wounded sinners, as my brothers and sisters. That's part of Jesus' holy life. The priesthood of Jesus is completely missionary and continues to be so, for he intercedes eternally for his brothers and sisters before the Father in the heavenly sanctuary. This is the priesthood that Jesus shares with all the baptized and on the foundation of baptism with all ministers and states of life in the church. Jesus' priesthood is a holy missionary life. Remove mission, there will be no joy. No joy in those who share in the priesthood of Christ, in baptism, in other states of life, and in the ministerial priesthood. The second point, participating in the missionary priesthood of Christ. It is not surprising that Jesus called disciples to be with him and to be sent by him as witnesses. It's always that, called to be with him in order to be sent. During his public ministry and after his res resurrection, Jesus called companions, students, or followers so that he could send them as his witnesses. Discipleship and mission are linked to each other as seen in the New Testament texts. For example, he appointed 12 that they might be with him and he might send them forth to preach and to have authority to drive out demons. Mark 3, 14 and 15. Jesus said to his disciples, it was not you who chose me, but I who chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit that will remain. John 15, verse 16. And we are today glad to hear again the words, as the Father loves me, so I also love you. Remain in my love. So we will say, oh, so I remain with you. But then Jesus will also say, as the Father has sent me, so I send you. Those are not contradictory in the mind of Jesus. Remaining in him and being sent by him while remaining in him. The ones Jesus loves are the ones he sends. Dangerous love, huh? The more he loves you, the more he sends you. When Jesus sent his disciples, he promised that the Holy Spirit would accompany them. He says, when the advocate comes, whom I will send you from the Father, the Spirit of truth that proceeds from the Father, 
he will testify to me. And you also testify because you have been with me from the beginning. You have been with me, so now go and testify. John 15, 26 to 27. We are in awe of having been called to belong to Jesus and share in his mission. It is the joy not of creating or promoting one's own project, but of participating in God's salvific plan in the missions of Jesus and the Holy Spirit. It is the joy not of inventing one's message, <laughs> but of proclaiming what one has heard, seen, looked upon, and touched of the word of life. It is the joy not of boasting of one's knowledge of the Lord, but of humbly being led by the Holy Spirit's testimony to Jesus. It is the joy not of being obsessed with achievements, degrees, oh, I have a doctorate, you only a master's degree. I deserve the cathedral. You deserve a village parish. That's not joy. It's obsession with achievements. It is the joy of gratitude to him who makes weak and sinful disciples strong by his grace. We wish every baptized Christian would experience the joy of being a disciple missionary. Without a vibrant friendship with Jesus, mission easily becomes a burdensome work performed by so-called missionaries who feel more like slaves than friends of Jesus and witnesses to the good news. But without mission, discipleship might become a lifeless prison. I met a former student of mine in the country to which his religious superior had sent him. This is a religious ordained minister. From the conversation, I learned that in the village where he ministered, there was only one Catholic. Only one Catholic. Feeling sorry for him, I asked him if he were not frustrated that after almost 15 years of rigorous religious and seminary formation, he would end up having only one parishioner. But with a serene smile, he said, that one Catholic is my flock. I will give to him all of my love and energy. Mission gives a baptized and an ordained religious zeal and joy. Even if you have only one parishioner. We need to add immediately that while Jesus called his disciples by name in a uniquely personal manner, he also called them to be with other disciples. As Chiara reminded us, St. Augustine, with you, I am a Christian. He sent them on mission with other disciples and missionaries. Discipleship forms community, which in turn becomes the womb that begets other disciples. Mission forms community, which in turn becomes the flame that fires up other missionaries. According to the first letter of John, the proclamation of the word of life by a disciple missionary to a listener 
has for its purpose, and I quote, so that you too may have communion with us, for our communion is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We are writing this so that our joy may be complete. The first letter of John, chapter 1, 3 and 4. The Christian community, as narrated by the first letter of John, began in a very simple manner by which a disciple shares Jesus to a listener who, upon receiving Jesus, forms a bond of communion with the pro proclaimer. But that fellowship or communion between two or three persons is indeed a communion with the Father and with Jesus, the divine and the human. Simple human interaction or conversation centered on the word of life that fosters unity, I think needs to be encouraged in our time, especially in families, schools, workplaces, recreation centers, hospitals, social media, during coffee break, and simple gatherings of friends. Sometimes we make things very complicated. Evangelization. It is a conversation. It is a conversation about Jesus. We also need to emphasize the proclamation of the word in dialogue with all the nations, cultures, and tongues of the world. The communion of the Christian community is not meant only for smooth personal and working relationships among ourselves. It is essential to authentic discipleship and missionary witness. Jesus prayed, I pray not only for them, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, so that they may be one as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. John 17. So the communion of disciples and missionaries, you know, either gives testimony or denies the truth about Jesus. The unity of the Father with Jesus whom he sent must be mirrored in the unity of those sent to proclaim Jesus. In our contemporary world, beset with nationalist and ethnic divisions, discrimination, armed conflicts, inequality, the communion of disciple missionaries from different walks of life and nations testifies to the truth of Jesus. The risen Lord clearly stated, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, Matthew 28. And the disciples from their nations will go to other nations and as one community of diverse nations, they will go together to all human, social, cultural, economic spaces in the spirit of dialogue centered on the word. The joy of priestly mission springs from the conviction that Christians belong to each other and to all human beings because we belong to Jesus. It is the joy not of independence but of relationships. It is the joy not of self-sufficiency, but of core responsibility. It is the joy not of lording it over others, but of journeying with them. It is the joy not of group or national superiority, but of mutual respect, appreciation, 
and enrichment. We wish Christians could ignite this joy in a world grown tired of individualism, suspicion, and fear of the other. When destructive and dehumanizing competition enters the Christian community and its mission, the whole world becomes a lonelier and darker place. May the groanings of despair rising from all corners of the world, indeed from the whole of creation, we hope would turn into a symphony of joy through the communion of hearts and the voices of disciple missionaries of Jesus Christ from all nations. I met a Filipino woman working as a babysitter here in Italy. There are many, many Filipinos here in Italy. She admitted that every time she prepares the meals of the two Italian children under her care, she wonders who is preparing the meals of her children in the Philippines. This is the This is the daily cross, or maybe even crucifixion, of a migrant parent. Uh, to my surprise and consolation, she added, but when I look at the two beautiful Italian children before me, I promise that I would give them the love that my own children deserve. This disciple missionary mother bridges families, nations, and cultures. And I want to say the world is a better place because of her. The third and final point priesthood, ministry, and mission. I served as a seminary rector for many years. I think around 15 years. The words I used to address to the bishop during the ordination of a deacon or a presbyter always struck me, always struck me. I used to say as rector, most Reverend Father, Holy Mother Church asks you to ordain this, our brother, to the responsibility of the diaconate or priesthood. Then the ordaining bishop responds, Do you know him to be worthy? Mm -hmm. uh, you have to sound Episcopal. Huh? And, uh, <laughs> and my response, according to the ritual, was after inquiry among the Christian people and upon the recommendation of those responsible, I testify that he has been found worthy. The bishop closes by saying, relying on the help of the Lord God and our Savior Jesus Christ, we choose this, our brother, for the order of the diaconate or priesthood. The community says, thanks be to God, or applauds. Now, those who have attended many ordinations might consider this opening rite as a formality. But no, it contains a spirituality and theology that the church has kept sacred for centuries. So let us dwell on some of the details. The, the right is very clear. It is not the person to be ordained that asks for ordination. It is Holy Mother Church that asks the bishop to ordain a person. No one 
can call oneself. No one can present oneself. And no one can apply for ordination. There are some canonists here. I always have a problem with that, no? <laughs> we ask candidates to apply. And then during the ordination, there's no application. Okay, let me finish this. No one declares oneself as worthy of ordination. It is the discernment of the Christian people and those responsible that establishes the worthiness of a person for ministry. The bishop openly declares that ultimately the church relies on the help of the Lord God and Jesus Christ in accepting someone to ordained ministry. Now, please don't get me wrong. Without denying the profoundly personal aspect of the baptismal calling and the calling to ministry and to uh, religious life, we should not forget the essential, essential role of the church in discerning and calling someone to ministry and therefore the role of the church in sending someone. If discipleship and ministry become purely personal pursuits of self-fulfillment, something is lacking in my heart. So I will enter the seminary. If discipleship and ministry become purely personal pursuits of self-fulfillment, there will never be joy, but only anxiety and apprehension caused by self-promotion and competition. Deepening the ministerial and missionary aspect of baptismal discipleship would enrich the discernment of vocations to ministry and states of life. We can also revisit the role of the church community and its leaders and their criteria in discerning the needs of the community for ministers and apply them to our times in the spirit of the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 1, 15 to 26, the choice of Matthias to replace Judas Iscariot. The Acts of the Apostles, chapter 6, 1 to 6. The institution of the ministry of the seven in response to the needs of the Greek-speaking widows. And Acts 13, 1 to 3. The setting aside of Barnabas and Saul by the Holy Spirit, discerned by the prophets and teachers in Antioch. Some of the criteria that were used you know, by the apostles then were the sacred scriptures, the emerging pastoral needs, respect for the ministry specific to each other, the qualifications required by the ministry, to name a few. But they prayed, they fasted, and allowed God to act through them like casting of lots. No one presented oneself as a candidate. The church called them. The church sent them. I suppose all of us here are baptized. Can I presume that? <laughs> and I suppose all of us are in some form of ministry or state of life, whether lay ministry or ordained ministry. Let me provoke a bit. I would ask you to recall how you got where you are. Did you apply for the position? Were you called and commissioned by the church? Calling oneself, presenting oneself, 
obeying oneself and sending oneself where one chooses to go make people anxious, not joyful. May the joy of the Lord be your strength. Andate in pace.